Uh, we shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Rohan Chavla, who is the Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology, uh, which is now consultant at RP Center. And he's going to be talking on clinical manifestations of intraocular candidiasis. On to you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chitra, and thank you, AIUS, for this opportunity. So I would be talking on intraocular candidiasis. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So intraocular candidiasis can be acquired either post-surgery, post-trauma or endogenous. And post-surgery, one would generally suspect if it is a delayed sort of endophthalmitis starting to occur few weeks after surgery. And uh, probably in the vitreous, if one sees these white flocculent uh, deposits in sort of a string of pearls appearance, that is more characteristic. But most importantly is the presentation, which is delayed. And post-trauma, it could be a mixed flora and sometimes it is difficult to pinpoint the diagnosis directly clinically and it might be picked up on uh, subsequent cultures. Uh, endogenous is the one which I would be restricting most of my talk on, which is mostly acquired from the systemic route. So uh, it is more common in immunocompromised patients or patients who have undergone long abdominal surgeries. And in our country, even after uh, not even uh, long-term intravenous infusions, but I have seen simple people getting drips for uh, diarrhea or something. And if they have not been given in proper setting with proper sepsis, asepsis, the people acquire uh, Canada infection from the intravenous route. And I, we have recently seen some cases following COVID. Now, is it because of the IV infusions or the addition of steroid or an overall immunocompromised state uh, induced by COVID is yet to be fully uh, determined. But we have seen these cases and I would show some of them. So for endogenous endophthalmitis in the posterior segment, I feel most of these lesions start as focal lesions, which are more again whitish in nature, avascular. And then they start, the common notion is that they spread from the choroid and go on to the vitreous. But recent literature and OCT has shown that uh, we can also have a primary retinal infection and which also can go on uh, involving the vitreous. So then this slowly evolves to evolve into a vitreitis, anterior chamber reaction. And if not treated well in time, it can go on to be a panuveitis and an infective form of panuveitis with a more of a fixed or whitish hypopion. So how to investigate these cases? First of all, you have to establish the clinical setting so that you are uh, sure that you're dealing with an endogenous endophthalmitis and look for a focus of infection in the body. And then we order uh, blood cultures, even if uh, at least three are generally said that one should get. For uh, candida systemic infections, uh, infectious disease specialists are getting this serum beta galactomannan test, but in the eye, I have found that it is a doubtful role. So uh, we also then finally rely on our uh, rely on our vitreous tap, and a simple KO stain or calcoflower white stain is perhaps the easiest and the uh, fastest way to diagnose these infections. And others are culture and PCR. I think someone will need to. Yes, mute. please, uh, all of you, mute yourself. Okay. Yeah. So the management of this is a little controversial and. Uh, it involves a combination of systemic intravitreal antifungals as well as vitrectomy. So the uh, choroidal involvement, one definitely needs intravenous uh, antifungals. The choice of the antifungal agent, all of these which I mentioned here uh, are helpful for candida. Amphotericin being probably the most broad spectrum one, but it can have other side effects, systemic ones. So one could probably start with the safer ones such as voriconazole. And uh, uh, some of these can later on be also given as in an oral form. But again, cost becomes an issue with some of these agents. Then we need to supplement the antifungal agent with intrafungal antifungals. And again, all of these agents and especially capsofungin, we have recently started using in this scenario as some of the candida uh, organism are found to be resistant to the other antifungals. And vitrectomy probably is to be resorted to once the vitreous gets involved. Okay. So I'll just show you some cases. So this was a patient or renal transplant patient on immunosuppression. So one of the eyes has this severe uh, uveitis and it was uh, no PL, but the other eye had this focal lesion at the posterior pole with overlying hemorrhages because since the infection had now come into the uh, in uh, retina. So what we did is we uh, tried to reduce his immunosuppression as much as possible and started him on IV amphotericin. And because this seemed to be a deeper infection coming actually from the choroid. So initially there was an outpouch 
stretching like this, uh, it seemed to be increasing. But just continuing the therapy, we found that there was a good response. Then after about three weeks, there was significant resolution. And we continued the antifungal therapy for about uh, two, three weeks more. And at two months, we found good resolution in one eye and we could at least salvage peripheral vision in this eye. Now, this patient is 67 year old with uh, decreased vision in uh, right eye for two weeks and had undergone intestinal resection for colorectal carcinoma. Now, the right eye vision was low because this one of the lesions is right at the macula. So these are again these whitish deep sort of lesions there with some cellular reaction in the eye. The left eye patient was not symptomatic, but we could see the lesions in the left eye as well. So is it a fungal endophthalmitis or is it some form of metastasis? Now retinal metastasis is again a very, very rare condition, but it can happen. So investigations, the blood counts were normal, blood culture, we could not grow anything. Serum beta galactomerin was borderline positive. And a PET scan was also ordered by the systemic uh, IRCH cancer therapy people and they did not show any evidence of metastasis. And on OCT, we found these lesions to be deep retinal and with some amount of probable choroidal involvement, but primarily deep retinal with a lot of vitreous cells. So we treated it as an inflammatory condition. And we uh, similarly, we found these cells in the left eye with the deep retinal lesion there. And we treated uh, these, uh, his, this patient with intravenous antifungals as well as intravitreal. So this, I'm just showing you some uh, subsequent photographs that as the week was progressing, despite our therapy, it seemed to be going into the vitreous in one of the eyes. So however, we continued the intravenous therapy followed by intravitreal uh, injection of amphotericin B. But still, as I showed you, there was some progression. So we were wondering whether it is a wrong diagnosis or there is a drug resistance. So we changed the therapy in the right eye to capsofungin and gave two injections of capsofungin. Then we found a very good response in the right eye with that. Now, however, uh, the patient in between uh, was lost to follow up and we had also not done a very aggressive intravital therapy in the left eye considering the vision was good. Uh, however, he received voriconazole in the left eye at another center without much response and rather worsening with a significant vitreous inflammation developing in the left eye. So we took up the patient for a left eye end of thalmitis vitrectomy. So you see there was significant worsening there and a lot of uh, vitreous inflammation had also developed with the vision dropping significantly. So we did a vitrectomy and uh, injected silicone oil as well, following which so one minute did remaining did settle. But then there was a uh, tractional detachment which had to be managed subsequently. So post-COVID end of these are interesting cases. Again, diabetic patients and post-COVID, this patient landed up with again this deep lesion in the left eye with anterior chamber and vitreous cells. You again see the OCT primarily involving probably the retina only. We again consider it as metastatic fungal end of and our vitreous tap yield on calcofluor white yeast cells. So we started again the intravenous therapy. So this is 21st June. We started treating her with voriconazole. At that time, there was a lack of availability of IV amphotericin, uh, the like. Uh, form. Uh, uh, so we could not get IV and amphotericin, but we treated with voriconazil and continued the intravitreal injections of amphotericin as well as capsofungin. We gave her around four injections. And as you can see in these photographs, there is a uh, resolution and she was discharged on posoconazole, which was continued for again, uh, three to four weeks. All this while her liver function tests were being monitored and this grew to be candida tropicalis. So, uh, as the lesion gets organized, you see, although there would be retinal thickening, but it gets organized, fluid reduces. And uh, by the end of the month, you see uh, there is a scar developing in the center with some subretinal deposits around it, which also subsequently by mid-September start reducing. And though the center is involved, patient does retain about 6 by 36 vision. Another young male patient who had already lost left eye to endophthalmitis had undergone vitrectomy with silicon oil at another center but not recovered vision and he came to us for follow-up so left eye we said we can't do much but when we saw the right eye we again noticed that there was a patch there and here the vision of the patient is six by six but we again considered it to be the same pathology happening in this eye and you see again the lesion involving primarily the retina we treated this patient again with uh, voriconazole and whenever we got amphotericin B, the liposomal form, we added that to the treatment. And again, this patient was treated with multiple injections of amphotericin and cap cap capsofungin. So you see the uh, photographs on 14 June, this is the lesion. By 19 June, you see some 
resolution at one of the edges is starting and then subsequently the lesion keeps becoming smaller you can even monitor it by oct and further resolution so this is the final picture now uh, in october where you can just see a scar there and the active infection seems to have resolved but the take home message here is that these patients do require multiple intravitreal injections and probably amphotericin b is still the broad spectrum drug of choice and whenever doubt you there of resistance you can add on uh, capsofungin so this is the article which uh, has described that endogenous endophthalmitis uh, the oct findings and they have uh, referred to the primarily retinal involvement over there so to summarize in such cases one needs to look into the risk factors to establish the diagnosis of endogenous endophthalmitis then the appearance of these lesions is whitish and creamy and they can be both a choroidal or retinal involvement and from my experience now i feel that when there is a primary choroidal involvement then intravenous antifungal is probably the mainstay and intravitreal would be the adjunct adjunctive therapy whereas if there is primarily retinal involvement then probably the aggressive therapy with intravitreal injections is the mainstay of therapy and of course uh, the systemic therapy would continue thank you thank you very much thank you very much doctor that was a very extensive wonderful talk uh, discussion uh, srinivas is not there um, is dr vishali there doctor. yeah it is a very good talk very good talk extensively covered uh, very well then uh, any uh, one uh, question to discuss dr avinash could you take it on before you go to our next speaker i just have a comment to make uh, especially in the setting of covid when we are seeing candida more frequently than we used to see before because till then we all know that candida as an endogenous infection is more commonly seen in western countries than in our country but uh, of late i would say that it's not too far away where you would find covid as one of the etiological agents for endogenous infections uh, that's the number of cases what we got to see and like what rohan had mentioned so these patients uh, it's not like candida albicans candida albicans is the best to get in terms of prognosis but the anything other than candida albicans especially in a covid setting are very hard to manage and we get and for repeated intravitreal injections and systemic as quick as posoconazole would be the best modality of treatment in such kind of cases thank you uh we shall uh, uh, just one question uh, quickly madam uh, uh very nice uh, presentation uh, dr rohan sir uh, uh, just one question is how uh, frequently we need to follow up these cases of uh, especially when they have systemic candidemia because uh, uh, the, the infectious disease society of the us and all they recommend uh, doing the ophthal examination as and when the candi uh, candidemia <laughs> is established so in indian sitting how frequently we need to use this was my first question and second thing is when i saw your cases uh, there was pretty aggressive where you have used uh, all sorts like amphotericin you have used uh, voriconazole and along with that uh, in those two cases you have used uh, uh, capsofungin four times that's the iconocandins so any any rationale in uh, using it the four times or is is it the guideline where we need to use it the four times Uh, so for the first question see initially it was a recommendation that in cases of sepsis one ophthalmic examination should be done but i recently read a report by the american society that the incidence now they are reporting to be very very low and they say that probably unless there is an ocular symptom it is not essential to have a prophylactic examination but maybe i would say in children if it might be still valid if there is a candida infection one should go as a prophylaxis and do an indirect for adult septicemia patients i think they are changing the recommendation uh, and regarding your other question the number 4 just happened to be the same in both the patients but the main thing is they require multiple injections and some case reports i read they have even given up to 10 or 11 injections so you have to just base on the response and as you get the response you can stop uh, the intravitreal injections capsofungin again is not the first line agent yet i think and in my experience somehow i have not got very good results with voriconazole so i would say go ahead with amphotericin and if you are not getting a response you can add on capsofungin and regarding systemic therapy like dr avinash said he says posoconazole but somehow our investi uh, in this um, in uh, infectious disease specialist at aims 
they would still they still said that uh, go ahead and start voriconazole and if available go ahead with amphotericin b but maybe probably because they were also seeing a lot of uh, uh, aspergillus cases and they were probably afraid that this might be a mix of this so they were recommending amphotericin b to be started whenever available two quick comments uh, sitting was there uh, oriconazole has an extremely short half life would not recommend as a monotherapy uh, for oriconazole that's the reason why you would have also seen rohan somewhere in his presentation of administering oriconazole twice a day am i right rohan oral intravitreal no intravitreal no i have not administered twice a day but yes like you said that i did not get very good response with oriconazole even if it was given at some other center patient was not responding because so, maybe they were not getting it twice a day yeah but it's a it's just like fluoroquinolone they have an extremely short half life so uh, that's one thing which we have to understand and second is why antifungal has to go on for a prolonged activity so candida is a very slow growing organism so that's a, it is very different than very aggressive looking bacteria so that's the reason why we have to hit it hard for a sustained period of time thank you thank you thank you